blessed by our time together already. Good morning. It is always a joy to be with you all, uh, regardless of where I stand, but it's a special privilege this morning to open God's Word with you, and I, I'm just so grateful for that. Uh, thanks to Pastor Andy for sharing the pulpit with me, and I pray that uh, he and his family have safe travels coming home. So today is New Year's, kind of a strange time to think about what it means to get into the Word on New Year's Day. It's not a typical Christian holiday. Uh, in other denominations, you might look at uh, what happened the week after Jesus' birth, and so you might talk about when he got his name and talk about um, his circumcision. We're not going to do that this morning. Uh, I'd really like to focus on what we tend to focus on with New Year's, which is talking about uh, hope, hope for the new year. And with that, some of us make New Year's resolutions. We, we make these little plans to try and make sure that next year will be better than the last. And in that mode of thought, I, I was really drawn to this moment, not in Jesus' early life, but in his early ministry. This time where he faced the devil in the desert, in the wilderness, by himself. And what he did there gives us hope for what, how, what is to come. And we sang about that already, some of the things that we hope for because of what Christ endured here in Matthew chapter 4. But beyond that, we also see a model that we can follow in order to try and uh, really get at this work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives of helping us overcome sin now, in the meantime. And so whether or not you're the kind of person who makes resolutions for New Year, I hope that you're on board with his mission of sanctification and that we can learn some things from what Jesus did uh, that can help us in that path. So. Uh, one thing that we'll see, we're going to see Jesus go through three tests, but he's going to go through them in the same way each time. We're going to see three things each time that Jesus goes through this, what Jesus does. He remembers God's word. He trusts God's character. And he looks forward in hope to God's promises. He remembers God's word, trusts God's character, and hopes in God's promises. And so with that, let's turn, if you're not there already, to Matthew chapter 4. And uh, I'd like to pray again that God would bless our time. So um, please pray with me. Great God in heaven, our heavenly Father, we thank you for a new year. God, we thank you for uh, the ways that you've shown your generosity to us, the ways that you are, are gracious and kind. Thank you so much. We look forward to what you will do in this new year, and, and we pray that our time in your word this morning would bear fruit um, today, next week, and in the year to come. And Father, we ask that you would generously, graciously help us to know your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to apply it. And help us to honor you in our time together this morning. And Father, we ask this by the Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've already read through the passage, so I won't read through it again, but um, I want to begin our discussion not in the temptation itself, but in the setup. There's a lot in these first two verses that we need to talk about um, that I think helps make sense of what's going on. In verse one, it says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. There's a lot even packed into that first verse, and it's important that we keep it all straight. Jesus was led by the Spirit. And if you know the context, you know what happens just before chapter 4 and chapter 3. Jesus is baptized. Jesus goes into the water, in order to be obedient, and he comes up, and the Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. 
And now this spirit and this loving father who is well pleased with the son is sending him into the wilderness for a very difficult trial. I found it very interesting, uh, a very, I, I really appreciated what um, an early church pastor named John Chrysostom said about this. He said, don't be discouraged, brothers and sisters, if you find yourself tempted after you're baptized, tempted after you've been in the faith for a long time, because that's not a sign of weakness. That's just the Christian life. Temptation comes into all of our lives, and it's not because there's anything especially wrong with you. It's because this is the Christian life. We have to endure trials and temptations. And the Spirit is with us. Well, Jesus goes into the wilderness, and I don't really have time. I'll, I'll try and unpack that as we go, but it's really important that he's in the wilderness. And, and just keep that in mind as we move forward. But the most important thing that I want to keep straight here is that last part of verse 1, to be tempted by the devil. You see, even though God is leading Jesus into the, the wilderness, the devil is the one doing the tempting. And we need to keep those categories separate. James 1 tells us that God never tempts anyone. God is perfect. God is holy. God would never do that. And so instead, what we see is much like with Joseph and the way his brothers sold him into slavery, God takes something evil and can use it for good. And so he allows the devil to do what the devil does in order to test Jesus, in order to allow a trial. And the important difference is this. The devil tempts us in order to see us fail. But the Father allows tests in order to see us succeed. God never wants to see you fail at temptation, but when he allows these things, it's an opportunity to prove your faithfulness, an opportunity to prove your character, and that's what Jesus will do here. Now, in verse 2, it says that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. That seems extreme. It says in the next verse that he's hungry. <clears throat> Why would Jesus fast in the desert? Uh, I used to think that maybe it was to weaken himself, to kind of put himself down on the devil's level, if I could put it that way. I really don't think that's it. When you look at the history of Scripture, when you look at what fasting is in the Bible, what you see is that um, fasting is a way of humbling yourself before God in the face of extreme circumstances. When the battle has been lost, when the baby is dying, when you finally realize the sins that you have committed or that your people have committed, that's the time when you see people fast before God. Times of great need. And throughout scripture, you know, eventually it becomes more common. Um, and you see more and more fasting to where Jesus has to give some rules about how to fast the right way. But what's clear is God even comes back and says the, the point of fasting is humbling yourself. Without the humility, it doesn't matter to me. So I think this is what Jesus is doing here. He is humbling himself in the face of a great trial. He is preparing himself, not weakening himself for some strategic value, but humbling himself before the Father, because that's what we should do when we are faced with great trials. It is possible to go 40 days without food. I don't want to get into all of that. Um, it's really interesting that he's not the first person to do this. Moses did it. Elijah did it. And I think the fact that Jesus does it points to how he is another great prophet just like them. But of course, he's so much more than that. So, here's Jesus, led by the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and he is fasting, humbling himself before the Father to prepare for this great trial. Now, when you think about the great battles in history or the great battles in stories, the great conflicts between good and evil, they're usually really exciting, right? There's, there's a lightsaber duel or there's, you know, the massive armies coming down the mountainside. 
this is the forces of good and evil meeting, and there's nothing romantic about it at all. There's no detail, there's no uh, excitement. We're really limited to, here's the test, and here's the answer. And that might seem a little unsatisfying, and maybe it makes you think, well, this really isn't all that big of a deal. But it is. All that means is that we need to focus on those two things, the tests and the answers. But keep in mind that this is where Jesus proves himself to be worthy to be our Savior. This is where Jesus goes through every temptation and proves himself faithful. God knows, of course, what's in Jesus' heart, but by being tested in this way, he reveals it to the world. This is the character of Jesus Christ. This is why he is worthy of our worship. And you might think, well, a guy like that, uh, he can't really fall to temptation, can he? He's God. God. God doesn't sin. Oh, this is part of the mystery of God with us, God becoming one of us. He is fully divine and fully human, and so we don't want to underestimate or, or nullify anything about his human nature. When he fasts, he is hungry just like us. And what the devil wants to do is take good things in God's world and twist them for his own ends. And so he's going to try and get Jesus to want something worth wanting, but to want it in the wrong way. And that's the subtle area of sin where he's going to try and attack Jesus Christ. God can't want things he shouldn't want, but can the devil get him to go at them in the wrong way? Let's find out. Beginning in verse 4. Is the, oh, nope, verse 3. It says, And the tempter came to him, Jesus, and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The test is, and each of the tests has this word if in there. The, the first test is a, a asking for a proof. Okay, if you're the son of God, I want you to prove it for me. If you have this identity, you should be able to do this thing. The son of God should have power over creation. John already said you can make loaves of bread. Or, no, 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 he didn't. He said you can take stones and you can make them into children of Abraham. I don't know if the devil heard about that or what, but we read that in chapter 3. God can do things with stones. Hey, if you're God's beloved son, just do that. Just some bread. Easy. Is this something that Jesus is? Is he the son of God? Yeah. Can he do what he's being asked to do? Yeah. We see that through the rest of the gospel, the way that he miraculously feeds other people. Absolutely, he can do this. So what's the problem? Well, Satan's putting it in this, just, he's got a little hook in there that says, I know you're hungry. I know you've been fasting 40 days. Wouldn't this be nice? You could do this. I'll make it real easy for you. Your proof can also help you out. And that's the essence of the test, is will you do this for selfish reasons? Will you want a good thing the wrong way? And Jesus says, isn't this interesting? He doesn't argue. I like to argue. I'm, I like to think I'm good at it. Um, if you're losing the argument, you can start to insult people. That's what we like to do. Uh, if the insults don't work, we can get physical. Jesus doesn't do any of those things. He's in the battle of his lifetime, in a sense. And he says three words. Well, it was one word in Greek, but three for us. It is written. No 
argument, no insult, no fighting. You ask me to prove my authority, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to rest in God's authority. What God has said is this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This one used to puzzle me. It sounds a little bit like he's deflecting, isn't it? Ah, bread. What I really love is God's word. Okay, you can love both, right? What's, what's the problem? Often when people, especially in scripture, invite you to, or offer you a verse, they're inviting you to a passage. And so I'd like to invite you to the passage that Jesus is talking about here. It's, it's back in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And, and hold a finger in chapter 4 because we'll be back. But Deuteronomy chapter 8. Rich Mullins liked to say that uh, Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy to the devil. Not the tactic one might expect. And the verse we're going for is in verse 3, but I want to start in verse 1 to give you some of the context. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do. This is Moses talking to the Israelites. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus is doing more than just un enduring a test for his own individual self. He's actually identifying with the people of Israel. See, the people of Israel were tested in the wilderness, and they failed. And Jesus is going to endure the same test and pass. And the first test is this. Jesus, or, or Moses says, God let you go hungry. You might not expect that from God, but he did, and he had his reasons. He wanted to humble you, and he wanted you to learn and know, my stomach may be growling, but I trust in God. I trust God's word. God's word is nourishment to me. And I think this is why Jesus did not want to turn this, these stones into bread. It's not that we should always turn away from food and turn to the word of God. It's that when God is hungering you, when God is making you hungry, when God is humbling you, you submit and you wait. And that is what Jesus is going to do. I don't need this bread. I'm not done fasting. I'm still in this trial and I'm still humbling myself before God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on the word, every word that comes from the mouth. I have to say, it's, it's just so exciting to see when Jesus is quoting this verse, he's also doing what he says we should do. He's nourishing himself on the word of God as he's doing it. Um, when you're staring down the devil in a desolate place, do what Jesus did. Remember God's word. Trust God's character hope in God's promises. If we had time, I would go through the rest of this passage, the next few verses here, talk about how their hunger in the wilderness was not a full-time thing. This is a stop on the way, what God was going to do, and it specifically says it here. In verse 7, he says, uh, no, let's see, verse 9 here, a land where you will eat bread without scarcity. Verse 10, you shall eat and be full. This is a recurring theme in the passage. I'm making you hungry to test you, but I will feed you. Wait, hope in my promises. Israel didn't pass the test, but Jesus did. 
So now we move on to the second test. The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Do you see what the tempter is doing here? That ancient serpent is still so crafty. Jesus said, I'm not going to do what you want to do because I submit to God's word and I trust God's character. And Satan says, okay. Let's, let's go over here to the temple. Let's go to the Father's house. You said you're the Son of God. We'll have another test. If then, if your identity is the Son of God, let's test God's love for you. Because look, if, if he really loves you, let's, let's test his character. If you really trust his character, prove it. And by the way, if you really believe in God's word, I've got verses for you. Psalm 91, I believe it is. Let's go to Psalm 91, because I think it's really powerful in its context as well. Psalm 91, and I'll just start reading because it's long. You can catch up. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High, who is my refuge. No evil will be allowed to fall you, befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On your hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. This is God now speaking. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Man, that feels good. That's encouraging. I'm ready to take on all kinds of things after reading that. God's with me. He sees my faithfulness. Let's do it. Is this God's word? Is it true? Is it trustworthy? Absolutely. The scary thing is, the devil knows how to use the Bible too. And he wants to take even God's good word and twist it so that you will be caught in a snare. And you'll think, ha ha, I'm on God's side, and God's on my side. But really, really, you've been tricked. And the thing is, Jesus not only knows Scripture, but he knows the context of Scripture. He knows how Scripture fits together. He has studied it enough, not just to be able to quote it, but to know how it applies in our lives. And he knows that God's promises, which are true, will not contradict his commands. And we don't have time to go to the passage that Jesus quotes, but it's another passage in Deuteronomy, and it's also about testing. And, and in this case, it's where Israel goes to Massa, and they're thirsty this time. And after all they've seen, the plagues in Egypt, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, after everything they've seen, what do they do? 
thanks God, I trust you. We're in the wilderness, I don't see where the water is, but man, I have seen you turn water into blood. This is not a problem for you. I have seen you part the waters miraculously. This is not a problem for you. Of course, it's not what Israel said. What they said was, God, did you bring us out here to kill us? Was that the point of all this? And so they tested him. They said, if you really love us, prove it by giving us water. Jesus knows, and we know when we think about it and for, for any length of time, that that's not actually faith in God. Faith in God doesn't say, God, if you love me, prove it. Faith says, I trust you. I, even if I don't understand, I trust you. And I trust that Psalm 91 is true for me. But I'm not going to test you to make you prove that. Jesus is standing there in the Father's house. And he doesn't, he doesn't deflect. He doesn't say, stop testing me, Satan. You know, I'm your God. He says, no, I do not test God's character. I don't test his power. I don't test his love. I trust it. When you're staring down the devil in a desolate place, you do what Jesus did. Remember God's word. Trust God's character. Hope in God's promises. Then we come to the third test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, verse 8, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This last one, maybe I was just a confused kid, I don't know. And reading all these temptations, it, it's hard to get it at first glance. And this one was also difficult for me. It's like, Jesus, you're God of the universe already. Why would this be tempting at all? What's the point of going up to a high mountain? Well, if we remember that Jesus is undergoing the trials that Israel did to prove that he is the faithful and true Israel, do you remember what high places stood for in the Old Testament? That's where you go to worship false gods. Once God led them into the promised land, over and over again, they fell for this trick. They said, ah, man, it would be really great to have what the other nations have. And so, of course, we'll go up on the high place and we'll worship this God, that God, all kinds of gods. We'll sacrifice our children to these gods. It's a nightmare. This trade that looks silly to us took out generations of Israelites. And I think we're really not that much better than they are. I think if it's hard to take this seriously, it's because it may fly under our radar. How long do you think it'll be after church today before you find something that you want and you're just willing to give a little for that? Something you're not supposed to have. Something that sin can get for you. Ah, just this once. Ah, you know, um, I trust God's promises. He'll, he'll save me. He'll, he'll forgive me. Just one more thing. One more thing. On a very small scale, this is us every day. Do the, do the ends justify the means? No. But when we're by ourselves, kind of mulling things over, eh, yeah, yeah, just this once they do. It looks like a really great trade. It's not a test this time. If isn't prove yourself. If is, let's, let's trade. I will give you everything in exchange for just a few words, just a little bow. 
seems like a good deal, doesn't it? Has anyone ever gotten so much for so little? And let's assume for the moment that Satan would actually follow through on this. If you were offered that trade and you were thinking about all the kingdoms of the world, maybe you're thinking, I could do a lot of good with that power. Maybe you're thinking, I don't need the glory, but man, you know, here's a problem I could fix and there's a problem I could fix. And maybe, you know, maybe one of these days I'll outwit the devil and once I'm in charge, I'll deal with all the sin problems. Satan is essentially saying, you know, God has promised to give you the kingdom, but he's asking a whole lot for it. I'm not asking any more than he, all I want is worship. I won't make you go to a cross. I won't make you suffer. Same goal, different means. And of course, Jesus is faithful. And this time he says what Adam should have said in the garden, be gone, Satan. You notice how the name changed over time? We're talking about the devil who is the accuser, the tempter, which focuses on him as a temptation. Satan highlights his role as the adversary. You, tempter, are my enemy. Get out of here. And the passage that he talks about goes back to Deuteronomy 6. And I hope you'll indulge me one last time. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and look at the context for what Jesus is saying here. I'm going to begin reading in verse 4. Moses again speaking to the Israelites. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Do not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. I could keep going, but I'll stop there. Israel got all these good things from God and traded them for false worship in the high places. Jesus rejects these things because he knows you could show me all the kingdoms of the world, but God's the one who gives cities that you did not build. That's what he did for the Israelites, and that's what I know he will do for us. Eventually, in, in Matthew 28, we see Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. All these kingdoms he did not build have been given to him. That's who God is. God's the one who does that. And I started a little earlier because I just, again, want to emphasize what Jesus has done here to prepare for this fight is he has nourished himself with scripture. He obeyed that part of the passage that said, understand my word, know my word, apply my word. This is how you will guard against idolatry. When you're staring down the devil in a desolate place, do what Jesus did. Remember God's word. Jesus knew it. He studied it. He knew what it said and how to apply it. 
trust God's character. No matter what situ situation you are in, God's word teaches us about God's character. We see that he is faithful. We can follow him. Hope in God's promises. The way things are now is not the way they will always be. The same God who brought Israel through the wilderness into the promised land will bring us, his church, into his heavenly kingdom. We pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The most important thing about this passage, I want to be very clear, the emphasis is on Jesus Christ, not on us. He is the perfect man. He did what we should have done. He's the Adam who did what Adam should have done but didn't. He's the Israel who was faithful in the wilderness. He is our God and our Savior and worthy of our worship. All eyes on him. But 1 Corinthians 10 also tells us that what we see in Scripture is a model for us to learn from. We see examples that should inform our lives, and Jesus is our great example. And so when we see him dealing with incredible temptation, we can learn from that in our own lives. Do you know God's word well enough to use it against temptation? I don't know that it needs to be the only tool in your tool belt, but is it one of them? You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't need to know all the verses about the things you struggle with. Start with one. And build from there. Can you say it is written in those moments? Jesus understood what the word said, how to apply it, and all in the context of trusting in God. And so, as we go out from today, it, Again, if, if you're the kind of person who doesn't make New Year's resolutions, that's okay. This is still for you. This is just a part of following Jesus. We will find ourselves in desolate places. And by God's word and trust in him and in his promises, we can stand firm. Let's pray. Ah, Father in heaven, thank you so much for the great help that you give us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for the example of Jesus Christ. Thank you that he, he is faithful. And thank you that despite all our imperfections, all our unfaithfulness, that we can benefit from his faithfulness, that you count his righteousness as ours, God. What a, what a glorious privilege. Please help us to walk in obedience. Help us to know your word, to trust you, and to walk in hope because you are worthy. And Father, we ask this by the Spirit, in Jesus' name.